What is postmodernity? <laughs> and I would say that postmodernity is a, a sort of a change in how we talk about buildings, not necessarily how we think about them. Um, and the, yeah, and a, a change in which the, the, there is more of a focus on the experiential qualities of, uh, of buildings, where formal aesthetics and expressive qualities are, are spoken about more. I mean, I, I emphasize on this, like it's a, a change in maybe how we talk about them, not how we think about them, because it's unfair to say that like maybe it's always compared to modernism. Uh, it's very unfair to say that that modern architects would not have considered such things, but uh, at large modern architecture was uh, discussed from a different angle. But I mean, there were many kinds of, uh, of modern architects, some of which I think very much influenced was modern architecture and, and figures like Lina Bobardi, who is considered a postmodern architect. Um, she completely embraced uh, or like tried to really create a, a very specific type of architecture of Brazil. And with that broke with a lot of the rules of, let's say, not modern architecture at, at large, but like some of the rules of, let's say, the international style, for example at the time so many of it ambiguous there. yeah and we also think it's always important to note that postmodernism is a much larger field where architecture has a very small sliver in there and we often come back to that uh, in the work that we do that it's really also just generally an intellectual stance uh, or a discourse that questions grand narratives or ideologies and looks sort of for, for the areas where it might be more complex than what it might seem at first glance. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, <coughs> move to question two. So which figure from the first generation of postmodernists do you consider particularly relevant to your own work? I think for me anyway, Charles Jenks, who was often around at the Architectural Association when I was a student there it was a big influence on, on me anyway, <clears throat> with his, I would say, reflecting to what we were just saying in the previous question, <laughs> a wider view on what, what postmodernism can mean in space and form. Um, and then, yeah, we have others also. Yeah, I mean, I. It's funny because one of the first buildings that I was taken to visit as a as a student when I started in in Madrid in Spain was a, a building by Ricardo Legorreta. I don't know if I would say that he's like a massive influence, um, but uh, Barragan, who is his master, certainly is. And uh, I I just wanted to point this out that is is kind of quite interesting when you are when you look at both the architecture of Luis Barragan and Ricardo Legorreta and how Barragan is considered a modern architect and Legorreta was modern architect. And I don't know, but like saying it very simply, like it just seems like Legorreta is the more commercial version of Barragan. And is that what makes him postmodern? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was my first, uh, let's say, experience of a postmodern building. Then, and a project that we keep coming back to, I think that um, is not, that we have not experienced is, um, the design for the LA Olympics by John Jared, but probably more important part of that project experientially is the um, is the graphic design by uh, Deborah Sussman and, and Paul uh, Preza. And that, that is an interesting example uh, that, yeah, we keep coming back to because it, uh, it sort of brings together graphics and architecture in a way that they become one. Um, and, and, and that is something that we are thinking about a lot, especially in our projects in, uh, in virtual space. And we, we started Space Popular in Bangkok, where we were based for five years, where Sumit Jumsai was uh, all around us through the most famous examples, probably the robot building from 86 and the, the elephant building, which are these very, very playful, uh, very formal projects. But really well, so well executed. I mean, it's at the same time is the thing and not the thing. Um, yeah. Mm. But a thing to add for our approach to this sort of architecture is actually that much more influential for our work and what we've studied much more than postmodern buildings is what's normally referred to as theming in architecture. 
Like we have done study trips and, and research into everything from integrated resorts to casinos and theme parks and other projects that fall more in that category. Um, and in the end, probably those sorts of spaces and that sort of way of thinking has, has perhaps been actually in the long run more influential than the work of postmodern architects. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's true. Just to bring up one other architect that, that that's, I think, speaking for both of us, we really appreciate his buildings and keep trying to explore them is uh, Fernando Higueras, um, which, yeah, that is just incredible. And buildings that I have never experienced, or like an, an architect whose buildings I have never experienced, but I, in photographs, really very much appreciate is uh, Shin Takamatsu um, as well. Okay. What role does architectural history play in shaping your work? We look at architectural history to, to sort of try and understand or perceive um, um, patterns, right? And, and try to use them. Why this is because we feel like when something becomes a recognizable pattern, then it, um, it becomes sort of available to everybody or, or it, it can be understood by, by everyone. So, so for example, this was like the big part of our thesis for the for freestyle, uh, which is uh, something that was presented in, in an exhibition at the RIBA, um, where we were looking at, in that case, patterns of influence of like, for example, how mass media influenced and shaped architecture throughout history. Right? So being able to understand uh, those patterns at a sort of very large scale um, enables you to see and what, what are those influences historically and to try and see like what could be uh, those influences today but at large like trying to identify these patterns um, helps us see like what are the gestures you could bring uh, to your projects that that would really communicate to to a wider public or, or to the people that you are intending to communicate to and i think we're largely also we're thinking a lot about the work of Marshall McLuhan in our in our work when it comes to also both physical and virtual space, and maybe specifically his analogy of the rear view mirror, which basically means that in his argument that it's not it's not even possible to create something new with a new medium, uh, but you can only fill a new medium with old things. Um, you can only walk into the future by looking backwards and um, this is something especially when when building and designing virtual architecture something that we think think a lot about especially when it comes to creating a context where people feel familiar and people feel comfortable to step into a completely new realm so that also then reflects i think on on our approach to history in architecture All right, I read the next one. Yeah. <laughs> How does your approach to history differ from that of the first generation of postmodernists? Mm, well, in, in a way, this question in, implies does it imply that we are the second generation of postmodernist <laughs> architects? And is there a second generation of modernist architects or a third or a fifth? <laughs> um, but uh, that being said, we completely embrace uh, these labels. Um, because we find it super productive to be grouped by other people, to be grouped together with other architects or other designers. It's like it really allows you to see what you share with others. Um, we try to do it ourselves, but it's obviously always much more interesting to see how uh, others perceive you. you know, what do they think that seeing our work or experiencing our work? Um, what are we a part of? Um, and then that might align with what you think, people that you think you have in common with. Uh, more or less, but it's, it's always really interesting to know. Um, so, I mean, if so, uh, if we were to compare ourselves to the so-called first generation of postmodern architects, I would perhaps say, say that um, our uh, built work and proposals uh, have always been very sincere. Not to say again that like some of the work and all of the work of postmodern architects, uh, the first generation was not, but I think we are often 
thought about or like we often approach postmodernism from that angle, especially from the big figures in the in the Anglosphere, right? I mean, we were mentioning a lot of examples that were from like Central America, Spain, and so on, where perhaps the approach was uh, slightly different, but if we are to take the usual ones, I would say that like, that's maybe where we uh, differ. We, we really look at history to learn from it and perpetuate aspects that we consider worthy. Um, and the ones that we don't, we would not integrate them in our work and, and criticize them in that way. We instead would like leave them out and, and just not, not perpetuate those. But like, yeah, the point of looking at history is like, what are the things that I can take that I think would be very valuable to to take forward? Like I don't know, like building brick walls, or <laughs> so. Yeah, <clears throat> but I think it might also be interesting to reflect a little bit on just again what what Lara was just saying with us being considered then possibly part of a second generation. We have been kind of trying to not associate ourselves too much with this because i would say that probably 90 percent of the times when we have been labeled as being in some new wave of postmodernism it has not been uh with a positive light on the work but rather as a critical light somehow which is then it just has become as i think for many many people a sort of point where you need to almost choose and uh, i don't know this is very personal but i, I I see similarities with how it's been like for me being a vegetarian for 20 years it's changing now but the first 15 years i have never said to anyone that i'm a vegetarian and someone says good for you that's well done but people immediately have some way to critically approach it. it's like isn't that leather shoes you're wearing or and somehow it's quite similar with specifically this tiny little sphere of creating architecture where uh, from outside, constantly trying to find holes and find weak points in your work. And therefore, we have never labeled ourselves as postmodern architects, not because, we, like Lara said, it's useful with groupings, but because it's just been quite often negative for us. And like Lara or said, that, it's, that our work is sincere, but we have often been also labeled as being um, either deceitful or our work is, is somehow not not truthful or it's it's not honest or i mean i think it's more like, uh, like uh, why do you use color and then it's like how is that you, why don't you but and, uh, like you often get to talk about parts of the work that uh, are maybe not that the the, what the core of it uh, mm. would be but that are also maybe important to, to talk about it's just like we don't find them to be the the, the core um, ideas behind mm. the work but then also our approach Today is hopefully more environmentally friendly, considering large figurative gestures in buildings than the first generation. And also our approach is very, very different since actually most of our work deals with virtual architecture where all of these things are completely flipped upside down. Okay. Five, I can yeah. do this one. Yeah. What is the role of figuration in your work? This relates, I think, largely to what we mentioned before, which is our work in creating virtual architecture, architecture that's never meant to be physically built with physical, physical materials, which means that quite often the thing, the sticking point when it comes to things like figuration is the, the cost or the resources that's required to make certain things possible in architecture, the labor cost or the material cost, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's constantly this balance with is that all the money and energy and resource we put into that thing, is it giving back enough? In virtual space, that is completely shifted, something that we explored in an exhibition uh, called Value in the Virtual, where we were questioning what happens to, to our cities and our built environments when parts of it that we experience is indeed virtual. And when it comes to digital materials and digital figuration, things like if we take two material examples like gold versus dirt, dirt is much more expensive uh, as a material uh, in a virtual environment than gold is. So all of this is completely flipped and uh, therefore we probably think about it quite differently um, than, than architects that purely focus on, on materializing their work in physical reality. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. And then uh, can I read this one? Yeah. What makes postmodernity relevant in current times? Mm. I ideologically, um, I would say that skepticism, um, which is a big part of uh, the postmodern approach, continues to be very important. Um, but, but we feel, however, that the challenge is to in how to navigate um, projects, how to navigate design process in which you are at the same time questioning what you're doing, but also not, not being uh, paralyzed by those questions. Um, so how to continue doing while remaining skeptical is, is perhaps what's, what's the hardest, but I think we are we are seeing a, a healthy level of skepticism uh, in architecture at large, which, which I think is, uh, is important and it will hopefully push all of us to really reflect on what needs to be done, how much needs to be done, uh, but hopefully not completely paralyze us because uh, it, it, it often feels a bit, um, it feels like that. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to remain in the spot where you can still bring yourself to, to even do something while, while these uh, worries uh, remain largely unresolved, right? Where you might be able to address certain questions and feel like you're doing certain things that, that might solve some issues, but uh, you never solve all issues at once. And every project has, you can always see issues with, with, uh, with every project that, that you didn't manage to resolve, but not letting those completely paralyze you, I think is, is a, it's a good way to go. <laughs> and some core ideas that, that postmodernism in architecture has carried through uh, from the first generation is very, very relevant uh, today when creating architecture, again, that is purely virtual. Mm -hmm. Because in many ways, when you experience something that's virtual, um, every single thing that you perceive in there has been created with intention, um, which means that in a way it is pure communication, which then really puts to, to point some of the arguments that some of the postmodernists were interested in, in this, idea that architecture can communicate, which of course, when you speak about physical architecture is very, very complex because uh, everyone reads everything differently. But if you're experiencing a virtual environment, then things can change by the minute or by the second. And also there's, again, literally nothing put in there that has no, that is, doesn't have intention behind it. So it, it's, if architects are to be involved in the next, 30 years or so of the building of some sort of virtual environment, then architects are going to have to dig deep into and address some of the things that the first generation of postmodernists were, were interested in. Yes, it's, it's been a, really a big lesson uh, to, to try and design uh, architecture in, in virtual space at the same time as you're designing architecture for physical space. Um, it's been a big lesson because um, you realize that like for things to be meaningful in the sense that like in virtual space that people would even know what to do in there in which the architecture would play a, a role of setting some context, then you need to be highly referential. And then we always questioned, uh, we are always questioned for doing that. Not like, why are you doing things that would look like they could have been built or that refer so much to physical stuff. It's like, well, because then, first of all, I don't know that I could do something that doesn't look like anything that I have ever seen. Like innovation at that level, I don't know who is capable of. Um, but that, that aside, I mean, it's just like, if you do that, then we lose on all the things that we carry and all the meaning that is embedded in the environments um, that, that are built uh, in physical space. And so, in doing so, when you create, let's say, the virtual version of a physical space or uh, of a function, uh, you try to bring a function that is usually done physical into the virtual space, then you realize that actually that building or that room was doing so much more than you thought, was establishing social codes, was setting up a certain mood, was doing so many things that you didn't necessarily think about because physically you designed that room because that's how we do those kinds of rooms, no? And like you question it to a certain level, but not maybe 
uh, every single bit of it and then suddenly bringing it to virtual space where like, you are represented as an avatar you are different like you realize how how many more things um architecture uh, was actually doing 